Rick. It's such a pleasure. Welcome to the show. Oh, it's great. I'm so happy to be here, honestly. And just as we were talking, kind of grateful and just kind of blown away, frankly, that we can do this. Even amidst all the crap, we can still do this, right? We can connect. We can talk. The technology is working right now. So I'm happy about that. Amazing. It certainly got its limits, but you know this is the, this is the benefits of it, right? So this is amazing. Yeah. So one of the things in which um, really caught my attention about this book, which it really fascinates me, I think, about you is you're a psychologist, uh, psychologist by nature. It's an objective field, very measurable. Um, you know, so I, I want to know. You know, what are the limits of science? Oh, <laughs> you and many other people. Very good. You want us to go there? Yes, well, yes. before we go any further, I want to ask you about the limits of recording technology. Okay. Are you sure you're recording this call? Oh, absolutely. My ecam is, uh, is going right now. <laughs> oh, that's good. I didn't see it. I wanted to make sure. Well, philosophers and saints and theologians have all taken a crack at this, as well as a lot of guys sitting at the end of the bar <laughs> after a few <laughs> pints, right? <laughs> and, um, so I'm, I'm not a professional, but I'll just kind of summarize it like this. Uh, science is a way of understanding natural phenomena. So phenomena within the so-called natural, ordinary Big Bang universe. Whether it's butterflies or black holes, science is a way of understanding it. So, as you know, that way involves independent observations that are not prejudiced by one person or another that uh, confirm each other and gradually rule out alternative explanations for why things have happened. So, through science, we gradually have understood that the variation in living creatures we see all around us uh, – there are you and me, there are monkeys and orangutans, there are dogs and cats, there are lizards, there are fish, there are worms. All right? How did this variety of creatures evolve as well as, of course, the plants? And we now understand that they evolved due to natural causes. Natural causes um, are a sufficient explanation through uh, selection and Darwin's theory and Wallace's theory as well of um, you know evolution. That's how it happened. Okay, good. So far, so semi-good. On the other hand, there are many natural phenomena that science cannot measure, it, such as the simple fact that if you, Joe, love someone or hate someone, no one can scientifically prove that thing which is true. So there are many things that are true that are outside the domain of science, even within ordinary reality. And there's a key fallacy that many people stumble into, which is exposed by the genuinely scientific saying that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Mm. Just because we can't do an MRI study of you or somehow put you on a lie detector and somehow prove that you actually do or do not love somebody does not necessarily mean that you don't love somebody for example. Then there is the ultimate question. This is where it gets really, okay. Let's go there. Um, yeah. What may lie beyond ordinary reality? And then we're in the realm of what I distinguish between, as you know in the book, supernatural and transcendental matters, potentially, such as supernatural matters being things like mind reading, predicting the future, ghosts, reincarnation, that whole territory. And then for me, the transcendental is a word I reserve for ultimately what other people might describe as God, you know, in a word. I, I choose transcendental because the word God um, has a lot of associations to it that many people balk with. But I'm just pointing to that which could be meaningfully, categorically distinct from the ordinary Big Bang universe, such as being unconditioned, not subject to arising and passing away, as are all natural phenomena, timeless, therefore, eternal, there's no passing of time there, and perhaps, perhaps, infused with consciousness and a kind of benevolence, um, as many people who've been interested in what could lie beyond ordinary reality have said. So my own, where I come down on this myself, uh, I have a personal uh, experience and view that there really are supernatural and transcendental matters. Uh, the transcendental particularly matters to me, not so much the supernatural as a 
factor or field of practice that said inside ordinary reality kids are crying your back hurts you wish someone loved you in the real world of stress and suffering and happiness uh, and loss and gain how can we practice how can we use what we're learning uh, through science informed by the most penetrating wisdom of the ages from around the world, how can we use that in practical ways? So that's why, end of the day, come down. And I try to remember what the Buddha advised himself to steer clear of what he called the thicket of views (laughs) and disengage from abstract arguments and focus on the immediate matters of helping oneself and helping others today. So what did he mean by the thicket of views? What does he mean by that? Yeah, apparently, as best we know from the surviving written record of what happened, a lot of people would come to him and try to argue with him, philosophers, religionists, and so forth, and he would just sort of cut through it all and basically say, are you happy? Are Are you suffering? What is causing your suffering? What would cause less suffering and more happiness? Let's talk about that, right? So he was really interested in the pragmatics of it all, the actual benefit of it all and um, that's what he meant very nice very nice I want to talk about um, you know it seems to me like hey how'd you like my answer I loved your answer Rick I oh okay your... good alright just check it just check it and see if we're gonna uh, uh, need a few more pints to keep on arguing about <laughs> it. really. it's a morning for answer. me in California I need my coffee not my beer <laughs> I loved your answer and um, yeah just picking up I, I'd love to know um you know, about this sort of hybrid approach between science and spirituality, because that is exactly where you end up, right, as a clinical psychologist and a man of obviously this faith, right? So I want to know is, to, to me, it seems like it's probably the most effective approach. Um, so I just want to know just what does that sort of, you know, how do you, ma- like, how do you marry those two ideas together? Because I've got friends that have a PhD yeah. in physics, and, and I just don't think they could... Like this thing just wouldn't, you know, it just wouldn't cross through their minds. So I know how do you combine those those dialectical ideas? Yeah, I, I really do get that it's a question. Um, for me, it seems really obvious, I guess, and so I want to kind of walk it through. Um, <clears throat> if we take a simple thing, people are stressed these days due to the pandemic. Of course, people have been stressed throughout history. People are stressed. <laughs> What is the basis for stress? What what makes us or what is happening such that we feel stressed, anxious, and angry, let's say? Well, we can explain that at the level of mental processes, psychology, the thoughts we have, the views we have, the, the feelings we have, okay? We can also explain stress at the level of biology, neurobiology, Hormones, cortisol, the amygdala is firing. Uh, people can become gradually sensitized through cortisol, the stress hormone. Uh, it sensitizes the amygdala, the alarm bell in the brain. It weakens, cortisol weakens regulatory parts of the brain, such as the hippocampus, that calm down the amygdala, which creates a vicious cycle. Feeling angry and lonely and hurt and frustrated today makes us a little more vulnerable to stress tomorrow which then increases our reactivity tomorrow, which makes us even a little more vulnerable the day after that in a vicious cycle. So that's a level of explanation at the physical neurobiological level, for example. And so to me, it's really quite straightforward to move back and forth between those two levels of explanation. They interact with each other. They um, uh, are intertwined. I think of them as two aspects that are categorically distinct. Thoughts are categorically different from things. Thoughts are not physical. They're intangible. They're, they're comprised fundamentally of information. And in some ways that remain mysterious, um, squirrels and cats and monkeys and humans and I think lizards and maybe spiders are having experiences of some kind or another. Experiences, of course, are also ineffable, and yet they seem like natural phenomena. We look around, other humans are having experiences, We think monkeys, elephants, cats are having experiences, maybe goldfish and, um, you know, uh, butterflies as well. So, okay, 
We're in the natural realm. Uh, I don't have a, I'm, that's a completely secular framework, very, very straightforward. Inside the natural uh, frame, we can also draw upon um, insights from people who've done a lot of meditation, sometimes in a religious context, perhaps, Christian monks who've been meditating a lot, years and years and years, or let's say Buddhists who been practicing mindfulness meditation or Zen or Tibetan practice. All right. And then these people, such as the Buddha, come back and they say, you know, I've got a few hypotheses for you. My hypothesis is that, number one, there is suffering. Mm-hmm. Number two, my hypothesis is that an awful lot of that suffering is caused by what could be called craving, which needs to be understood as an underlying sense that something is wrong, something is missing, and I need to move into fighting with what's unpleasant, driving after and grasping after what's pleasant, and um, clinging to other people. Aha, then we have a hypothesis. There's no God involved in that hypothesis. Mm. There's no supernatural, there's no transcendental, it's a straight-up hypothesis. It's the Buddhist drive theory of suffering, taking a phrase from Freud 2,500 years later. So anyone who's a doc, I have friends and teachers who are deep Buddhist practitioners who are stone-cold atheists, <laughs> hardcore, <laughs> very principled, very intelligent um, atheists, or you, they might grudgingly admit that they're agnostic. They don't know for sure, but as far as they're concerned, the transcendental and the supernatural most likely don't exist at all, and even if they do, they're irrelevant to practice. And they're full of pitfalls, too, so they want to steer clear of that stuff because of the mistakes made, obviously, in religion over the centuries. So, bottom line, there's a lot we can draw from people who are, quote-unquote, religious. It's arguable whether the Buddha was, in fact, religious. But in any case, um, we can. there's a lot we can draw from what those people have to say as hypotheses. And then we test them in the evidence of our own direct experience, knowing that just because there's no MRI study yet for our own direct experience, our experience is evidence to us, at least, and sometimes to others who notice that as we do practices, we become less of an asshole. (laughs) 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 I'm lucky. Um, You know, so that part's very straightforward to me. And then to go to the, now then, where I think you're, so I've kind of been careful here. And I think it's important to be careful because then when we sort of establish the distinctions, then we can really kick out the jams and go for it. So then there's the ultimate question. Um, <clears throat> does it serve people within the natural frame as they heal from their trauma, let's say, or help themselves be less stressed and unhappy and, and more effective and contented day to day or even if they are interested in self-actualization, peak experiences, the upper reaches of human potential, does it serve that process understood as something within the natural frame that involves natural phenomena uh, at the two levels of mind and matter, let's say? Does it help people to um, uh, bring into their personal practice or how they deal with the the despair of losing a loved one, say, to bring in something that is supernatural or transcendental. For many people, it is. Uh, The American Psychological Association, for example, some years ago recognized the fact that secular therapists and and in within a secular psychotherapy there could be respect for the ways in which a person's faith tradition is a comfort to them a refuge for them, a moral guidepost to them, can help them in their recovery from addiction, let's say, uh, can give them reasons uh, to be more patient with their children and not hit them, for example. So that's a key distinction, whether, you know, it's of use for people to, to bring in something that is supernatural or transcendental, obviously acknowledging pitfalls. There are ways in which I think bringing that material in can be problematic, even within entirely a natural frame. And then the ultimate question, of course, is whether there are influences with, that, ought, that land within ordinary reality here on planet Earth. Are there factors? Are there influences? Are there causes and conditions that are supernatural or transcendental that are beneficial? here on planet Earth. 
And that's a deep, deep question. I think efforts to prove the existence of God, let's say, from natural phenomena such as the so-called God gene or what lights up in the brain, I think that's foolish and misguided because obviously any so-called evidence of what lies beyond the natural frame could be fabricated within the natural frame. You know, we don't know. We don't know. But I will say for myself that at the end of the day, I am interested myself in the ultimate matters. And uh, in a sense, I would say probably 98% of what I do is just day-to-day -day here on planet Earth, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm working the neurons to get them firing together so they wire together as well. And still, uh, a, lot, a major purpose for me personally, which I don't try to advocate for others, it's just for me, a major purpose for me in doing that is to become more available to the divine, to become more available to the transcendental, minimally as the Buddha taught, uh, that which is unconditioned and timeless, not subject to passing away, and potentially a consciousness and a love beyond my own. Wow, wow. Sp certainly speaking to you, I certainly get a feeling that you do think that there is more than just the Big Bang. <laughs> yeah, that's my opinion. Mm, yeah. It, uh, but... I think arguing about it no, of course, yeah, yeah. is just like, oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> what a dead end. What a dead end. I love it. It's certainly food for thought. Um, yeah. One of the things uh, that I wanted to speak to you about was I, I spoke to um, Tal Ben-Shahar last week. Do you know Tal? I don't know him personally. I know of him and I know of his work. Yeah. One of the things in which he said to me, and he just mentioned during complete passing, almost as if you know it was like a, a tangible rant that he went on, and he goes... I just can't understand why in the West we make such a differentiation between the mind and the body because it really cripes me. And I, and I, I didn't really think about it too much. Now. I was lying in bed like a couple of nights later and I was like, I get it. <laughs> Do you agree with what he said? Well, I have to know what he, I would wonder what he means by it. I think, um, I think it's self-evident that, uh, that, that an idea a piece of information, like, for example, um, an image of your uh, school you went to when you were a, a kid, right, or um, a thought is intangible. It is made of information. It is immaterial. It's, um, it exists, but it is intangible. It is categorically distinct. Yeah. Information is categorically distinct from the material substrate that represents it. So, for example, I'm show, holding up a blank piece of paper here. That's the material substrate. I could write anything on that blank sheet of paper. I could write your name or I could write the score to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony on this sheet of paper. But I could also take that same piece of information, your name or the formula for the area of a circle <laughs> or the score to Beethoven's Ninth, and I could represent it in other forms, on a computer hard drive, uh, in electromagnetic waves, and so forth and so forth. So information um, is distinct from, you know, um, energy and matter, which represent it, in, in that sense. So I think the mind, which by which I mean, as most neuroscientists fundamentally mean, all the information in the nervous system, uh, which seems still somewhat mysteriously to be the basis for the experiences, the phenomenology uh, of squirrels and people, all right? That's different than the meat that, that is the necessary basis for it at one level of explanation. At another level of explanation, if I understand what Tal is saying there, um, mind and matter co-arise. They are two categorically distinct aspects of a single unified process. And as someone who avoided philosophy classes in college because I wanted to protect my GPA, uh, I've learned <laughs> late in life through Wikipedia, my friend, that uh, there's a term for this, apparently from Leibniz, I don't know. So philosophers, please help, help us out here. A dual aspect monism, the idea that mind and matter are dual. They are cat they're different from each other. Intangible is different from tangible and it's a monism. It's a single unified process, certainly as far as um, creatures with the nervous system are concerned. So interesting, so interesting. So let's dive into your latest book, 
yeah. this is the following on from Buddha's Brain. So, yeah. Neurodharma, tell me about the title. Uh, it's cool. Well, you're really getting at Tal's comment. So, uh, essentially, we can know ourselves from the outside in, scientifically, right? Serotonin, dopamine, you know, uh, the amygdala, what's going on there, genes, the genetics. We can know ourselves increasingly well in that scientific way. We can also know ourselves experientially from the inside out, psychologically, uh, meditatively. And for me, neurodharma is the word I made up for where those two meet. It's a challenging word. It's a deliberately audacious word. Uh, it To those who... Um, it's it's not religious inherently. I mean, I use the word dharma as a kind of audacious nod to the world's uh, wisdom traditions, the perennial wisdom, which is not found only in the East, obviously, which is where the word dharma comes from. Um, and I think myself, wow, why would someone not want to know themselves in both ways? Mm. Why would someone be strictly materialist or strictly psychological, why wouldn't you want to know yourself in both ways? It seems so useful. Let, um, let's suppose you have a headache. <clears throat> and I could say to you, well, well, Joe, you know, if you uh, focus on the image in your mind of a beautiful mountain meadow and you just start thinking about the sound of the wind in the trees, all right, that might help your headache. Okay, that's a level of intervention through the mind, through the first-person perspective, as it were. On the other end, I could say, wow, I noticed that your blood pressure is high and that you probably have hypertension. That's increasing the intensity of blood flow in the meninges that wrap your brain. Um, I think uh, you uh, might be helped by taking this little pill and lowering your blood pressure so that you don't get headaches so often. That would be useful. And um, someone could even, so you see right there, the usefulness. Why would someone want to push away what's useful for a person? Let's assume there are no bad side effects in the pill for your high blood pressure. Why would someone want to push that away? On the other hand, why would a standard medical doctor want to push away the fact that if it does, let's suppose, that certain kinds of visualizations or meditative practices help people with their migraines who chronically have headaches. Why not bring them both together? It just seems wonderful. And if you're interested, as I am, in both uh, every you know healing trauma and being effective and reasonably happy in everyday life, additionally, if you are, like me, interested in what's the next step, well, that's the next step to take for oneself in the uh, up toward the ultimate possibilities of inner peace and happiness and wisdom and an unshakable love. Yeah. What's the next step? If you're interested in that process, as many people have been, and I definitely am interested in it, and I'm watching your eyes right here. You seem pretty interested. <laughs> in it too. Wow! Why wouldn't we want to know? Let's, or at least start having some plausible beginnings of guesses, even without complete knowledge. Neuroscience is a baby science. Okay, there's a lot we don't know yet. But still, there are things we are starting to learn about what is happening in the brain when people are really dropped into the present with a strong sense of feeling whole uh, and a great feeling of calm and strength while feeling kind of open to and supported by everything. Wow, wouldn't you want to know? <laughs> and then use that. If, you, if, if increasingly it's clear there's certain neural processes that are the underlying bodily basis for those really cool psychological states, which then over time can become traits. We grow them over time, right? Then you would think to yourself, okay, if those circuits, woo, are involved in that, why not get more skillful at lighting them up? <laughs> why not get more skillful at activating those circuits, or I'm using the term circuit loosely here, activating those physical neural processes that are the basis for these really beautiful, refined, useful states of consciousness, you know, and then by stimulating those circuits, we strengthen them. 
And then more and more, we hardwire into ourselves the physical basis for a very stable serenity and happiness. Yeah, I love that idea of the neurons of fire together, white together, right? Yeah. And you mentioned happiness, but then this just completely popped into my mind. But I feel like this is a theme in the book. So I'd love mm -hmm. to ask you, it's a huge question. How happy can we possibly be? That's really great, isn't it? <laughs> I think there are two ways to answer it. Um, one is, if you imagine the scale from minus 10 to plus 10 as a simple way to talk about mood or happiness. And I want to make a distinction here between two kinds of happiness. Uh, Tall would be able to speak really articulately about this. What's called hedonic happiness or well-being and eudaimonic happiness or well-being. As you know, um, hedonic is the happiness we have when we're just having fun. Right Pleasure. or getting Pleasure. yeah, well, many kinds too. Getting things done, um, loving your partner, uh, um, enjoying a sunset, enjoying a good meal with friends, uh, um, the pleasure in, in in feeling calmer, feeling more tranquil. These are different forms of hedonic well-being. And then there's the sense of meaning and purpose and fulfillment, even if we're not enjoying ourselves in the moment, like walking our baby up and down the hall at three in the morning, it still is something very meaningful and fulfilling. Uh, I'm watching Foil's War, which is a series you may know of British, you know, sort of crime detective stuff set in World War II, okay. and learning a lot about the history. And obviously there were people at that time who were not experiencing hedonic well-being, flying like the RAF off the coast of England to go into combat with very high mortality rates for the pilots who were doing that every day and yet it was deeply important to them to do that of course so we have these two kinds of happiness or well-being so we imagine the minus 10 to plus 10 scale and then we make a distinction as well between your resting state where do where do you tend to rest where's your equilibrium are you hanging around a minus three where a lot of people are kind of you know they're kind of mildly depressed mildly fried you know they can bump up from there but that's their resting state it's like a big planet whose gravitational field keeps pulling them back down again to minus three or people who are severely depressed you know around a minus six seven eight nine or ten even and then um you think about people who are fairly pleasantly cheerful day to day you know mild well-being day to day they're like a plus two that's their resting state and then around that resting state people can have passing experiences so, by definition, I think we can uh, have passing experiences of plus 10 or even minus 10. The worst day of your life, the most terrible thing that happened, shocking, ter terrible pain, agonizing pain, down minus 10. Hopefully, you don't stay there. Same thing. Um, total peak experience. Day your child is born, day someone asks you to marry them, uh, it's just a, a moment out in the woods. I've had all times where in wilderness, it was just fantastically good, fantastically good. But can we stay there? So then the question becomes, can you move your equilibrium position up the ladder, as it were? And can you increasingly experience resting state profound contentment just on just complete contentment you're you there's no discontent there's no frustration uh, profound peacefulness it's saturated with a profound love uh, wow i think that's possible because we see people who are there in our lives today in the world they're rare they're less common than olympic gold medalists wow. but still but still, and throughout history, we have beings who talk about that, um, who seem to act on the basis of being there. You know, their resting state is plus eight, plus nine. Whenever they want, they can kind of go all the way up to uh, to ten. And I think that's really possible. I, I know from myself, I really have become a lot more mellow and happier and, and, and at ease and kind of I, uh, sort of a wash in well-being. And I still get irritated. Stuff happens. But, you know, the question then becomes how rapidly can you return to your positive resting state? That's a key uh, indicator of how resilient a person has become, how deep their practice is. Well, we get knocked. 
things happen. We get rattled, but how quickly do we, you know, regain our equanimity and, and our fundamental well-being and our capacity to cope as best we can? I want to ask you about this idea of, you know, happiness. And when I talk about the spectrum from <laughs> minus 10 to plus 10, and as yeah. you were saying that, I was thinking, I've heard a lot of people just anecdotally say things like, you know, make comments saying things like, I, for me, the meaning of life is to be happy, right? And, you know, fair enough, you know, I, 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 you know I, I, I can't comment on, you know, whatever someone else's meaning of life is. For me, when I was a lot younger, I felt, um, you know, going through my life, it wasn't that, you know, I was ever unhappy. It was more of a state of numbness. That's what I yeah. would say. It was, you know, I was, you know, I just felt almost stoic, you know, like, yeah. that, like that, that That would be how I, how I felt. So when I was coming out of that, you know, towards my late teens, mm-hmm. I really wanted to feel the depths of emotions without necessarily yeah. getting lost in them, without, you know, yeah. bordering into rumination. So I'd love to know just in terms of the, uh, just in terms of the happiness section, is, is there a goal to seek happiness? Mm. What do you think about that? Well, can I ask you a couple of questions? Oh, please, sort of? please, please. All right, great. So uh, think of a friend. Okay. Uh, you could also do this with a child, perhaps your child. Uh, would you wish that your friend be happy? Yes. Okay, what do you mean by that? Uh, I would say that I would, you know, like them to avoid suffering, avoid trauma, um, you know, have an overall good sense of wellness. Right. So the avoiding suffering, the avoiding trauma is, is spending as little time as possible below zero yes, yes <laughs> in yeah. that way. Right? Yeah. And you would also wish for them that it wasn't just not miserable, mm-hmm. not sad, more than not anxious. You would wish for them that they would have qualities of positive emotion, uh, both hedonic and eudaimonic forms of well-being. You would normally wish that for another person. Yeah, we wish that for people because for two reasons. One, Simply, it feels good, it feels better to be authentically grateful uh, rather than uh, to feel frustrated and disappointed. Now, a key point, of course, as you all know, is to not fight frustration and disappointment when we feel it. We feel what we feel. There's nothing in what you and I are talking about that's about positive thinking or fake it till you make it. Okay. So... Uh, so first, we'd have two basic reasons for wishing that our friend was happy, or happier even. And we would wish for our friend, yeah, sure, why not be even a little happier? Uh, so one reason is because it feels good. The other is it is good. Happiness is good for the body. It's good for physical health. And happiness makes us stronger, makes us tougher makes us more resilient. A lot of research shows that. Uh, and, and the aspect of happiness, which is eudaimonic happiness, you know, a sense of meaning and purpose, is very important uh, as a resource when we're dealing with horrible situations like, you know, being a soldier in combat or, or dealing with terrible losses. Um, a fundamental sense of that happiness, which it has to do with feeling in a deep level inside yourself that there's meaning and fulfillment in your in your own life. That's a real resource. Also, third, the happier people are, on average, uh, the more they tend to be kind and forgiving and generous and cooperative and reasonable in their dealings with others. So, right there, we have three reasons for which there is tremendous evidence uh, in both psychology and and medicine um, that, as well as what we see in everyday life, that uh, happiness is a worthy goal is a worthy goal. There are pitfalls, of course, in pursuing any goal. We can get all stressed about it. We can get all comparing about it. Uh, And there are experiments that show that if you manipulate, call it sophomores, (laughs) usually (laughs) in some kind of way, uh, that you can make them unhappy by encouraging them to try to be happy. Okay. But then those are fairly artificial manipulations. Fundamentally, uh, 
it seems obvious that um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you know, as the three fundamental values stated in America's Declaration of Independence uh, from the mothership many years ago, uh, are worth doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think worth that, pursuing. Absolutely. I think that um, maybe this was just a semantical issue because I read this great Chinese uh, proverb the other day. Have you ever addressed the story of the farmer's horse and the maybe so, yeah, maybe yeah. not? And, yeah. and I love that. And it, you know, I think that the, the general message of, I suppose, we don't know the value of a moment. So I think that where I was coming from was perhaps um, that... You know, sometimes not getting what you want is a so is a is a yeah, can be a wonderful right. stroke of luck. But I guess that your yeah. point is that that's a is that it's a different language type thing. That this that it's a semantical issue, not um, you know the key component, which I get. Um, oh yeah. Well, part of what's happening here too is you're profoundly thoughtful, and so we're really getting at, you know, in a mutual way, exploring some really deep questions. And um, so it, it really gets pragmatic, right? Yeah. Okay, let's suppose that, for me, I think there are three reasons to not kill yourself today. Okay. <laughs> I'll put it that way. <laughs> why keep on living, right? Why, why keep going? Why do it? And I think there are three whys in my opinion, you know, three sort of buckets of whys to keep on going. Uh, one is quality of life, broadly defined. You know, to, to eat another cupcake, to enjoy another sunset, to hug another friend, to make love with another partner, uh, when, or to make love again with your partner, let's say, to see your children flourish and succeed, all the totality of under the heading, we could say, of quality of life. Happiness, well-being, fulfillment, purpose, all of that. Ex expressing your abilities, all of that, okay? A second purpose to keep on going, independent of that first purpose, is service. For example, those RAF pilots who may have been completely terrified and completely unhappy and sad and worried and in physical pain, they still got in their planes and took off to protect their, their country. Uh, so we, we do things for service purposes as well, I think, or could, uh, independent of quality of life purposes. And then the third purpose is a very interesting one. I think it's distinct from the other two, which is broadly learning, w under the heading of which I include awakening, enlightenment, and for those who are interested in it, a, a joining with. It's interesting, the root of the word for yoga is joining or union. To form a union with the transcendental, the ultimate, the divine. And so those are kind of like three sort of, you know, buckets of whys. And then we might ask ourselves, okay, what are, the, what are the factors that serve each one of those? Let's suppose you would like to improve or increase in some meaningful sense your quality of life or to become more effective at service contribution, or even serve, you're learning, you're growing uh, if in its own right, for its own sake, including spiritual learning, let's say. Uh, what helps that? What helps that? And to me, that's the fundamental framework here. So we see that it helps us to increase our quality of life. It actually even helps us as well to uh, be more effective in contributing to others, and it helps us um, learn, too, to look for beneficial experiences as the first step of growing those positive traits inside ourselves. To look for experiences of calming, to grow traits of calm. To look for experiences of grit, determination, fortitude. Screw it. I'm going to keep on going. The cockroach theory of life. Keep yeah. crawling. Yeah. I subscribe to the cockroach philosophy of life. Keep crawling, right? Keep on going. Keep trying your best. Do your best each day. Um, you know, that when we have experiences like that, including experiences of spiritual insight or um, gratitude or closeness with our friends or camaraderie with, like, I'm enjoying this conversation a lot, um, it, it is skillful means to have these experiences 
when we can and deliberately create them when we can also, and then help them leave lasting changes in the brain. Help them change us so that gradually, little by little, breath by breath, synapse by synapse, uh, we become actually over time a little happier, a little wiser, a little stronger, a little more loving. To me, that is clearly skillful means. And most of the experiences that we grow from actually are positive ones because they are experiences of what we want to grow. Yeah. And it feels good usually to experience yourself as a determined cockroach who will not be defeated. <laughs> you know, that feels good. <laughs> or to experience, you know, yourself as someone that a really smart guy named Joe wants to actually talk with. <laughs> right? That's a good thing. Uh, most pain has no gain. Yeah, there are some gains that are only achieved through pain. They're, you know, in wilderness and loss and combat, whatever. You know, there's certain life and death, you know, situations and so on. Okay, there's certain lessons, certain gains we only get through pain. All right. But it's also interesting to ask, were there other ways to get that same growth, to learn that same lesson, to be changed for the better in that way without so much pain? Could we have acquired that gain through other means? And also pointing out that most pain has no gain. And in fact, pain is anti-gain because it wears us down. Yeah. It stresses us. It makes us weary. It makes us more vulnerable to stress. Most pain is not good for us. And also the actual front end of the process of growing is in most cases through experiences that feel emotionally positive. So I think it's crazy that we have this industry of people these days who bang on about why pain is so good for you and uh, people who are interested in gratitude and, and happiness and self-worth are like children. They're so silly. They're sentimental. They're not really seeing it. You know, if you're not miserable and angry, your eyes are shut, blah, 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 blah. I think that's crazy. Mm. Crazy. Well, I wasn't planning on killing myself, Dave, but I got three more reasons not to. <laughs> yeah, Joe, don't do it. Call me first. <laughs> <laughs> you have my word. You have my word. So I can appreciate that we're running out of time. So I want to finish off with, um, so obviously in the book you've got these seven timeless principles, right? I want. Yeah. I always like to finish off with just a real practical um, topic. So yeah. just a real practical solution. Um, so in the book, uh, obviously you've got these seven amazing things. And one of the things in which I'd love to get a suggestion from you on is that whenever I, you know, interact with our Instagram and I ask them for questions, a huge thing seems to be self-acceptance. Ah. So I'd love to know, do you have a practical suggestion Yeah. on, I guess, how to accept oneself more? Oh, Yeah. Um, well, in my experience, there are several things that really help, and I'll just name them. Maybe we could do this almost experientially, sure. so people listening can look at this, or you and I could do it right now. I had a lot of issues with feeling inadequate, worthless, damaged, broken, unlovable, so, um, you know, I speak from some experience here myself yeah. about this. So, one aspect of self-acceptance is uh, tender, sweet, and it's emotional. It's the aspect of self-compassion, where we bring a supportive quality and feeling to ourselves uh, and to our own suffering and our own pain and to those parts of ourselves that embarrass us or we feel ashamed of or we or seem less than other people. So if we, uh, let's suppose a person feels rejected or left out or unwanted, a key aspect of self-acceptance is to work the muscle again and again and again of compassion for oneself, much as one would bring compassion to a friend who had a similar experience or situation and that's a useful method right there if it's hard to bring compassion to yourself think about what you would offer to a friend who was feeling the same way you do and then try to bring it to yourself again and again 
Uh, it can, and that, that, so that's one aspect to grow self-acceptance. Another aspect of it is, is more rational, where you recognize that um, other people are messed up too. <laughs> You're not the only person. <laughs> and that um, it's not fair to be so hard on yourself for being certain ways when you're not hard on other people. It's unfair. In other words, it's a, it's a, it's a moral principle. It's ethical <clears throat> to treat ourselves like we would treat others. The golden rule is a two-way street. We should do unto ourselves as we do unto others, and we usually treat other people better like than we that. treat ourselves. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the rational part. It's logical. You, you realize, no, this is not, it's not fair. Uh, and you also start to recognize that beating yourself up all the time, self-criticism and self-shaming and, and disowning parts of yourself and trying to hide them and, and feeling, you know, embarrassed about them is not good for you. It's, it's, you, you're not helping yourself. So that's a logical part of it all. Then I think in addition to this tender part of self-compassion and the logical part of what's fair, uh, there's a part that's sort of muscular where you say, you know, I don't want to feel like crap anymore. Or you start to realize one a major collection of reasons why I feel like crap is I took inside myself the crap that other people were giving me, were my parents, my my big brother, my big sister, the priest who taught, you know, school or whatever, you know, my coach, uh, the bullies, uh, the stupid media. I've believed a lot of crap. I've taken a lot of crap on, and I'm sick of it. I've had it. I I don't want to feel this way. I'm gonna be strong for myself. I'm gonna be like a friend to myself. Um, yeah, you know, in the mountains, right? It's snowing. It sucks. We're cold. Big breath, keep going, right? That muscular feeling. Um, so I think that's a third aspect of it all. And then last, I, I actually have this in the book, uh, is in the chapter on um, suffering, uh, on equanimity, the chapter of resting in fullness. I talk about the importance of getting at what's in the basement of the mind and clearing out those old experiences of uh, feeling bad. And also in the chapter on wholeness, that's the fourth practice, you know, being whole, feeling whole, which means including all of yourself. I have a whole practice there on self-acceptance. And what a person can do in regard to that is know what it feels like to accept something for what it is uh, that's easy. Like, can you accept, um, you know, that you know, there's a towel on this desk right now where I'm resting my arms. So the scratchy wool blanket underneath it to make this room quieter for a recording doesn't keep irritating me. Big deal. So, oh yeah, I c can I accept that it's white? Yeah, it's white. I can accept that. You know, uh, I may wish it to be a little different, but you know, I can accept the way it is. Know what it feels like to accept something easy. Uh, know what it's like to accept qualities in your friends that are easy to accept, and then start moving toward uh, things in yourself that are neutral. Can you accept that you have ten toes? If you do, let's assume you do, or accept that you have nine toes. Maybe you have nine toes. I don't know. You know, and then work up from there to accept things that are increasingly challenging, and then deliberately um, expand the range of what you can accept about yourself. So I would I would say those things are very real. Those are very real ways to accept yourself increasingly. I love it. I love it, Rick. Do you have any closing messages for our audience, and where can they connect with you? Oh, thank you. Well, first. Uh, I found this to be an unusually deep and interesting conversation. So one message I have for people is to listen to, to your podcast, uh, for real. Uh, and, you, and you did not pay me to say that, so it's, it's for real. Um, second, uh, people can go to my website, rickhanson.son.net, and one thing I would just really suggest is check out my online programs. They're very inexpensive. They uh, are some are very bite-sized that involve, for example, the Just One Minute program. It's full of lots of little things you can do that are all less than two minutes long. They're really quick. I believe in quick practice. You know, boom, boom, right? Also, check out the NeuroDharma online retreat. Uh, it's based on a 10-day meditation retreat I taught 
that's now really summarized. We videotaped it and edited it really tightly, and it's got the meditations, the talks, and a lot of bonus material. And um, as with all my online programs, while they are inexpensive, and I'm quite happy for people to buy them, uh, they're reasonably priced. If people have financial need, we give away a lot of scholarships. We love scholarshiping people. So um, that's one of the purposes of doing those programs, to be able to offer them for free uh, to people who um, can't afford them. So that's what I would say. And, and then on a more cosmic note, maybe I'll leave you with um, a couple of quotations from my please, book, actually, please. if you'd be up for that. Absolutely. I'll, yeah. I'll, give you, I'll leave you with three okay. uh, that kind of speak to a lot of what I think the, you know, the opportunity is for us, the, the process is for us. So one is the quotation that opens the book altogether. It's from, these are all three from the early teachings of the Buddha. Train yourself in doing good that lasts and brings happiness. Cultivate generosity, the life of peace, and a mind of boundless love. I'll read it again. Train yourself in doing good that lasts and brings happiness. Cultivate generosity, the life of peace, and a mind of boundless love. It seems to really summarize yeah. what we're up to. And I like the emphasis there in training. Train yourself. Train yourself in doing good that lasts and brings happiness. That word from a really hardcore renunciate monastic teacher, the Buddha, who is perfectly prepared to practice painful asceticisms. He's talking about do what brings happiness. Right? Second quotation from the Dhammapada, think not lightly of good, saying it will not come to me. Drop by drop is the water pot filled. Likewise, the wise one, gathering it little by little, fills oneself with good. Day by day, breath by breath, there's a proverb, if you take care of the minutes, the years will take care of themselves. I find that very hopeful because it's the minutes that we have the most influence over directly and immediately. The next minute. What's the most important minute of your life? The next one. Mm. Minute after minute after minute. And then the final quotation is um, our best uh, understanding of the Buddha's last words. As he was lying on his deathbed, people gathered him around him and uh, they asked him for his teachings. And he said, uh, in a translation from Stephen Batchelor, uh, who's uh, British, um, things fall apart, tread the path with care. So you have the teaching of impermanence and the reality of suffering, things fall apart, tread the path with care. I love that word care in its aspects of conscientiousness and in particular love, heart, bring heart to your path. Things fall apart, tread the path with care. Rick, this has been such a pleasure. I want to link everyone as well to your podcast, Being Well, because I think it's fantastic. So everyone just swipe up and they will get everything. Rick, this has been such a pleasure, my friend. I will link you everything when this goes live. I enjoy this so much. Um, completely for, for me as well, Joe. Really, and I really wish you well there. Take good oh, care. You too, absolutely.